Mm. Welcome. Welcome for all of you all over. We have people from all over, so we're really happy to see you all. Um, we were thinking before, just before we did this, or I was thinking at least, that this is, uh, this, it right now marks three years since we started doing these online talks. Um, because sure. it was three years ago at this time of year when we were stranded in Thailand. Now we're choosing to be here. We were choosing then anyway, but anyway. We were stranded here, and um, the world was really on lockdown. And it was a time at that point of extreme uh, confusion and what we would call transition. Um, and yet nobody, it was uncharted territory. So we didn't, no one really knew what was going to happen. What was going to happen. We had the thought, oh, it'll be It'll be a couple of weeks, and then it'll be over. And here we are, um, three years later. And so it's very symbolic in a way to be talking about the topic for tonight, which is transitions and thresholds. And, the, and that kind of follows on the talk we did last time, which was on um, obstacles that get in the way of yoga. But obstacles that get in the way of change is also something that is relevant to these times. Um, and so we'll kind of cover, we'll tie in a little bit of the obstacles bit with the idea of what transitions are. And we, um, We wanted to kind of fast forward to today um, where we're in a time that seems often that there are incredible transitions happening in the world with uh, politics, with environment, with um, interactions between people, with human rights abuse, where since we started doing these three years ago, and hopefully there isn't a cause and effect <laughs> result or <laughs> relationship between yeah. us doing Don't these. Don't you find it suspicious <laughs> yeah, that we started doing this? Yeah, we started doing, started doing it and the world fell apart. That's that. Maybe we should stop these. But our hope is that these actually help. And, and it makes you see when you look at the sort of disarray that the world is in. It makes you see the value in transitions and how when you fall asleep, um, during transitions or during times of change, um, and you, you become kind of dull to them, things change, and you wake up later, um, and it's a different situation entirely, where you have not had um, any contribution, made any contribution to the way things are. Um, I'm thinking, obviously, as an American of this week, where we, in the first time in our country's history, our president has, our, our ex-president, <laughs> yeah. excuse me, <laughs> our ex-president has uh, been indicted and is on criminal charges. And so we are really looking closely at how did we get here from a time of great hope and enthusiasm just you know, five or six or eight years ago, um, 10 years ago. And part of it was that things change. If you believe anything that's written in the uh, Indian texts about Sankhya or, or sort of transformation and the idea that part of suffering is not being able to come to grips with impermanence, change, yeah. change um, and that, that really all change is happening all the time, and that it's this process of, as we've said, the gunas on the gunas, or these different uh, sort of characteristics of, of creative energy and matter and interfacing of, you know, sort of 
sattva, rajas, and tamas that causes changes. Um, so it's happening whether or not you're awake for it. And <laughs> and yeah, how often are we awake? How often for change? I mean, just yeah, very in the last ten. In the seconds. last 10 seconds, <laughs> yeah. not very often. Yeah. Um, and so it's really fascinating to step back a little bit and look at sort of the big notion of change or uh, transformation. And then also the idea that um, maybe there's a way, if we have some tools at our disposal, that we can impact uh, these transitions, and that we choose them in a way that is beneficial for the bigger picture in which they seem to occur. Mm -hmm. And part of what we learn when we practice yoga asana or pranayama is how to embody this idea of transformation or transition from one thing to another. You're in you know, triangle pose, and you've done your whatever, three fast breaths, five fast breaths. If you're in an Iyengar class, you've done like an hour, whatever length of time you're in it. And um, then it's time to come out. And so often in our yoga practice, especially in uh, asana, what we have seen is that point where there is this transition from being being in a posture to not being in a posture, uh, students or we ourselves mm -hmm. um, check out. Uh, you know, we forget what we're doing. And it's at that point in the uh, mm -hmm. process of doing a posture, very often, where injury um, occurs. Because all of these aspects of the body that have been online, ready to kind of do what they need to do, without even you thinking about it, they say, oh good, we're on vacation. And they let go, and then old patterns of behavior or misalignment or injury that have been there before, they pop back up. And so we've seen time and again, that is so often yeah. when injury occurs. Yeah, even if you have this developed concept of I'm gonna do constant yoga and every position between every pose is an infinite number of poses yeah. because I have a concept of it then still <laughs> <laughs> there's a point where the conceptually I, I give it up and uh, then I'm back to just uh, you know, being unaware completely of the transition of the moment it's amazing how and then, brilliant we are as it, it's, creatures. It, it, it's kind of part of the process of doing things, is to have those moments of just sort of falling asleep as you're awake, in a sense, yeah. or as you're semi-awake. It's almost like some, we can't help but do it occasionally. <laughs> <laughs> I just did it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then we get angry at ourselves or we get embarrassed yeah. or either deny it yeah. or you know, dwell on it. Yeah. And so it's, yeah. it, this, is, this is what we're wanting to talk about, is to look at how each of us can uh, do some things, um, take some actions, make some changes in behavior or approach to things where we... Um, find a bit more time to be awake a little more of the time um, so that when I look at how we got you know back again to politics um, how we got to where we are right now where there uh, is a, a past American president who has been charged with a crime where some of the most um, what might I say, clownish uh, characters that are not funny clowns, they're mean clowns, like the Joker, um, mm -hmm. are ap appearing um, as his supporters, like Marjorie Taylor Greene or George 
uh, <laughs> Santos, who appeared, you know, oh, we're all for you, Donald. And, and the rest of us were just sort of dozing off in the background, watching these transformations happening and not quite knowing what to do and therefore um, waking up to something that is way beyond what we might ever have imagined. And so that, of course, is an extreme case of what can happen. Uh, but for all of us, as Richard and I go through transitions ourselves, um, rumor is that we are aging. We think people may have noticed. And that's a huge transition where you start realizing, wow, I'm not 20 anymore. And as you yourself age, you'll notice that, you know, you start realizing at some point uh, that, that there is a limit in time um, in terms of mm. what you can accomplish, what you can do for yourself and for others and for the planet. Um, and so time becomes the great uh, teacher, the great teacher of transition. And those of us who have been around a little longer, we have certain kinds of experience that if we don't um, look forward and back um, and to this moment and say, here's what we can share, um, with you, then um, we're sort of missing the boat on what we might do. And when we were looking at this idea of transitions and thinking of uh, historically and uh, mythologically how it fits into things, one of the characters that showed up, of course, is Kali, who represents transformation and time. And, yeah. and time. But then also in Roman mythology, the idea of Janus, who's the two-headed uh, god or figure, mythological character. And he, is, um, he has two faces. One is looking into the future, and one is looking into the past. And then he holds in his hand the key to uh, change, which is the present. And uh, so in Roman mythology and, and rituals, as well as in many other types of uh, religions or um, types of sort of indigenous practices, there is this, this element of having a key or having a threshold or having awareness in this moment so that instead of just blindly walking into um, suffering, suffering <laughs> you have mm. options. And so, mm. really, one of the things that has helped us is to listen deeply to uh, teachings from friends of ours who are older than us, uh, you know, even one's parents, you realize at some point they actually had some good things to say, it, who have had a chance to look back and they've had a longer uh, distance that they can look back than you might have had when you were, or than we might have had when we were thinking we knew it all at the age of 14, or 20, or 30, or 50, or whatever. And we certainly don't know it all now, but the idea is that you look back and then you can look to the future. And there's yeah. Bushunda, who oh, is a wonderful character in Indian mythology. Yeah, Bushunda the crow, uh, who um, turns out to be the oldest uh, creature in this particular story. And, uh, and he's lived through many, many uh, creations and destructions of the whole universe. And somehow, because he's a crow, uh, and 
<laughs> but, uh, and he's a one. So this is all from this wonderful book, which most of you have. Uh, You're familiar with it. Yeah, the Yoga Vasishta, yeah. which is, uh, you can get the, the shortened form, um, which is called the Lightweight Yoga Vasishta, <laughs> which has all of the best parts edited out because every chapter begins with descriptions of nature. Uh, you know, just like uh, what is, you know, it's because the teaching takes place in different forests and jungles or mountains or, you know, different places. And it goes on and on just describing, you know, what is going on. And so that, about half of the book is that, and it's all been edited out. In the shortened version. In the shortened version. And just goes to the actual, what's being spoken of as the teaching. And uh, it's kind of like you're missing out on the best, which is just... Why don't you go out and just take a breath of air and just look at, you know, the sun and the moon and the, uh, the you know, the stars. But then again, it's an enormously long book. <laughs> um, four volumes. Uh, in, And you can't possibly carry it around with you. And you can't even uh, store it on most computers. It's too many... Uh, What's the term? Megabytes, tetrabytes, you know. <laughs> so, uh, but Bashunda is a crow, and a crow, of course, crows are, you've probably seen a few of them, um, they're very famous for eating dead bodies um, and just stuff around. And, um, and so Bashunda is, uh, he's probably the most skilled crow of all. And he lives... So they eat residue. <laughs> yeah, they eat dead bodies. And, uh, and then crow poop is the lowest... <laughs> well, like vulture poop. I and mean, I guess crows and their relatives. Uh, crow poop, nobody wants. Not even other crows or vultures. Or even bugs. <laughs> like, oh, it's crow poop. And even though it's probably nutritiously has more interesting... <laughs> Things in got us off track there. Sorry about that. No, it's not. It's right on track, actually. Um, and so it's something repulsive to other creatures. And so just remember that the in this story, the whole universe is represented as this gigantic tree-like thing. And Bashunda lives on the most southern uh, part of the branch of the tree of time. And it's... Um, and so the teacher, Vasishta, who is the guru of Rama, and Rama is, of course, Vishnu, the same god, who has this... Uh, and Rama already is pretty good with all this. But Vasishta is such a sweet and uh, lovable teacher that uh, Rama keeps going to Vasishta and asking him questions, like, how do you eliminate suffering? You know, so... Uh, and so Vasishta says, well, uh, let's check in with the, the real expert. This is after teaching, uh, doing all these teachings on all the different levels of the mind and the different uh, manifestations of what we would call mind. You know? And that mind is actually a, considered to be divine, uh, even though it's cause of suffering and it, suffering is composed of, you know, Thoughts and yeah, <clears throat> being attached to this and afraid of that and uh, happiness, distress, and so he says, "Well, let's go ask the expert, who is this ancient crow." Uh, and so Vasishta travels, you know, through his uh, power, he travels and he finds this crow, and the crow is surrounded in, within this tree of the, uh, and the crow is surrounded by endless numbers of other crows, because this is the boss, you know, the master crow. And, and he starts to ask him, and the crow sees Vasishta, and Vasishta is uh, what we would call uh, punya. He's like a bodhisattva, but he's like the ultimate 
And the crow just gets so excited. He uh, gets comes off of the uh, and uh, greets the greets him and says, "What can I do?" And Vasishta says, "I have some questions for you." And uh, Vashunda is just like, oh, "You got to be kidding me!" <laughs> you know that you would have questions for him. But he then starts to ask uh, the crow about uh, what he has seen, because the crow has seen the arising and passing of not just this universe, but of endless numbers of universes. And uh, he just went, well, what can you do? You know, and he's seen, and the crow goes on and on about all the different layers of mind that you have, you know, your basic, you know, kind of primitive ego mind, and, you know, that tells you stories about survival, you know, and a mind that you know, all kinds of creatures have, and then minds that higher beings, or beings that think they're higher, like human beings and stuff, they have this intelligence, and they have a discriminating awareness, and they're great philosophers, and they're also religious, and they have all kinds of different religions that uh, they come up with. Uh, you can probably think of a few of them, um, you know. And finally, uh, the uh, crow says, and all of these things are actually, when you see it, uh, you let it go because you start to see it sacred. And then he said, this is the great mystery. And the great mystery is, of course, then in, and in the in history, or uh, which is histos or flesh, and so he starts to point out the sacredness of that which is obviously impermanent, which is the fact that all experience uh, is embodied uh, in samskara. Uh, even those experiences that we think are uh, wonderful, mm -hmm. uh, they are, uh, they live, leave a residue, which is, of course, the crow's great, in, is, give me some residue, you know, some uh, shesha, uh, and that's all there. And so then the crow says, well, the secret that I figured out and that I learned uh, is... He says, in your heart, you have what's called prana and apana. We've never talked about no. this very much. Okay. What is that stuff? <laughs> yeah. Which is, and prana and apana, and then the pausing of prana and apana. This is uh, to be discovered in the heart. And the crow was saying that this is the method of discovering all beings within the heart, that the heart is actually, when you start to feel the uh, pattern of the prana and the pattern of the apana in your heart, and because your heart is has all beings in it, you feel it everywhere, that this is actually the way of discovering uh, the beauty of the impermanent, the beauty of, which is the creative energy. And so in Sankhya, this would be the, de the Devi Shakti, or the creative energy, which is beautiful. And then, of course, philosophically, well, I want to, I have to be able to tell the difference. And, or we tell ourselves, I have to tell the difference between uh, this Daivi Shakti, or Spanda Shakti, or this vibrance, and that which isn't even vibrance which is just pure, uh, pure awareness doesn't change. Mm -hmm. But your concept of pure awareness changes. And this is, and so the, the bird is taking delight in the teaching of the apparent paradox that uh, philosophers, because you know, we all are philosophers, even, uh, even if we are not very good at it, okay? All, all creatures ultimately at some point in their different embodiments are philosophers. It's poor subject matter. And uh, they get hung up in that even 
if they kind of, and what you have to do is you got to get a feeling for the fact that, ha, ah, and that's just feeling the uh, spanda as, in you, if we call it sensation, you've got to be careful that you'll have a concept of what the sensation is, and then with that concept, it'll help you focus on some sensations, but then you'll start ignoring all the other sensations. And you'll see yourself doing that, and you have to go, ha, ah, that's so funny. Okay. And so he taught, so Shunda taught um, Vasishta, and at the whole time, and just laughing, that because Vasishta, he said, you're actually the one who's taught me, and teaching me all this. As we speak, I have such affection for you that I'm just learning it. Um, that moment by moment, uh, you release it, and that release is the joy. And in the release, there's no, you know you don't mind whether oh this is just a very small local sensation or a local phenomenon that arose, or it's the big important picture, uh, which we would call the. Uh, and in terms of the story, the geopolitical is just looking at um, the, the, the tiny little moment in time, which is our planet or our galaxy, which is considered almost uh, funny. Yeah, yeah, it's all like, oh, oh that galaxy. And, and uh, that it's then embodied. And that this allows, that you feel this pattern of prana, which is this arising, this beautiful arising. You feel it all over the place. You feel it above and below, and then the apana, you feel it above and below, and to all sides. And so the people are always interpreting the text, and they think, well, he just located apana above the head. The or, exhale, yeah. Yeah, which is what makes you exhale, which makes everything dissolve. And the confusion is then almost played with that people think, oh, that's so that prana and apana are really inseparable, or at least they, they love each other so much that they love to change places. So as I, I'll feel the apana in the pelvic floor, it's home, or I'll feel the apana at the crown of the head. Or, but then actually when you're really feeling the apana, the prana is so happy that you're feeling it, it's really like, well, notice that you're actually feeling the opposite. And uh, it's a very playful way, and this is what's a beautiful thing about this particular text, but there are also so many texts and stories in different uh, traditions that are just playful. And uh, that's the hook. Yeah. And... Uh, and, you know, for, and if you don't like the crows or gigantic trees or crow poop, okay, if you're a normal creature, uh, then you can find other stories. <laughs> and all of these stories, they encourage you to keep going back and uh, keep communicating. And so what happened is was the teaching was finished and Vasishya said, well, I got to get back because uh, he had taken off, I got to get back to Rama, and you know we got to finish up this other story that I was involved in. And the crow says, "It's just too excited. I can't love." And he he traveled with Vasishya back. I forget how many eons of time and distances, you know, like because ast astronomers are always worried about you know these huge uh, light years and things. So he traveled gazillions of light years with him, saying, I'm just too excited to have you. And finally, he let Vasishta go, and he was just like, so sweet. Uh, and so what Vashunda demonstrated, even as a crow, was that he just was absolutely adored other beings. Um, and that was his teaching. And that, you know, also, you know, it, it takes the the tendency of mind to um, make pretty much anything we think about uh, into a sort of dualistic sort of mm -hmm. 
a mind state, so prana and apana, or time, past, and future, that these are two different, somewhat, somewhat related, but maybe unrelated, not mm. the same things. Um, and which that tendency of mind is a way of really short-circuiting the ability to be with the process in the present moment. In the present moment. Mm. And so, to me, the story has also always really represented this idea of, you know, the need to uh, pause in, for instance, the, mm. you know, the yogic practice of prana and apana and pranayama. There is this element in that wave pattern of pause. Mm. And that's what the threshold represents in yeah. daily actions, is that you have this, this element that, you know, in some, like, temples and um, even some churches and things, the threshold is not just a sort of thing to cover up where the wood floor meets the cement. It's, it's something that is actually built up and you have to kind of stand there and wait. And traditionally, in many temples, you pause as a moment of reflection, and then you step with your right foot, usually, over... Depending on, yeah, the, depending group, on there, the group. There's some strange moves. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. But you, you consciously, depending on whether you're this group or that group, you take one of your feet and consciously place it down, but it takes this moment in time where there is this gap, where you have the opportunity to dissolve, where the mind can drop into the embodied experience at hand and let go and dissolve into the experience of uh, action, um, which, and the experience of uh, interfacing with the moment. And so it's, it's fascinating to look at the practices, like the embodied practices like pranayama or asana or chanting, where you have these built-in thresholds. And the thresholds can become, they can become a, a blockade, they mm -hmm. can become a roadblock, they can become an obstacle that then becomes an opportunity. Or more often than not, when you doze off in your actions, they just are overlooked and trampled. So they're like an old speed bump in the road that has sort of worn down after years of people flying over it, not noticing it. And this mm -hmm. opportunity to uh, take conscious action and to, to have a moment of waking up. Pause. That that's lost. But fortunately, in the very next breath, in the next action. <laughs> Nirota is yeah. the word for pause. Yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah, that this is, and so Nirota is kind of the continuous, say that Nirota does not. Uh, interfere within the manifestation of things, but it allows time then to... So time is even paused, mm -hmm. it seems. It's as if time had stopped, and then... But then you see, oh, the appearance has, is, is taking off again. And so then, ah, the, you're allowed to even see the, uh, what you don't want to see. Or what you know, your formulas have said, like, you know, I'm, my mind is very petty, or is, I'm having a grand, you know, important thought, okay, which I prefer, you know. <laughs> and then you see that you prefer it, and you're, uh, you're oh, and so that threshold uh, is constant, mm -hmm. um, and it it makes me think of thresholds, well. Where we are currently, yakshas are always at the gates of things, and these are uh, a yaksha is uh, a 
scary, well, the modern yakshas are gigantic, scary protectors of things. Um, and traditionally in, in Indian stories, a yaksha is uh, that which is, appears right in front of your eyes and usually is very scary to people. You know, when they actually see the truth of impermanence, they go. Uh, or they see the, the depth and the, uh, of what's actually going on. Um, but then to actually see the, so the yaksha is the transmute, transmutation of all of the things that we don't want to deal with, like emotions. Yeah. Okay. And so uh, you come to a temple, you come to, uh, you know, in your own house, um, this would make it difficult. Your house wouldn't be fun, but occasionally, like, <laughs> you know, the, let's say the front door, you can have two yakshas standing there. And, and of course, at, at certain airports, uh, there are yakshas, and this is yeah. extremely important. Uh, and yaksha literally means coming forth right in front of your eyes or in front of your awareness. And so uh, often... Which is what is happening currently. And eyes just being symbolic of, sound, of all the senses, and even the mind, what is coming forth, is stunning. And, and the things that come up right before our eyes are often the things that we don't see. They're the things we think, oh, I'm looking for happiness or bliss or meaning or the truth. And some, you know, thing pops up in front of us, like we've had some incredible experiences with wildlife in the last couple of weeks around our house nice with day. a cobra and a bat and the baby birds and all these things um, that, you know, you could say, oh, it's just is such an inconvenience to have a cobra on the front steps, which actually was kind of true. But if you don't see that as what is being presented to you, and instead you're sort of saying, please get out of my way so I can get on with my business, you're missing the opportunity to, mm. uh, to really tap into connecting, as Richard, you were saying, from the core of the body, to the experience right before you. Yeah. yeah, the classic metaphor is, I can't see the forest because these trees are in the way. Yeah. Um, which is very, so then you get philosophically and you fly high above the forest and you're looking at it like, oh, that's a beautiful kind of ocean of kind of greenish colors. But that's not actually, that's the forest from one point of view. But then when you get into the forest, then you get lost in like, particular uh, trees or birds or insects yeah. or... <laughs> the moss or whatever, yeah. Yeah, and, uh, but, and the mind just can't... Oh, wait it's so second. hard on the mind. And, <laughs> Poor <laughs> mind, it's so stupid. Yeah, <laughs> and so when... Um, let me just look. this. So this really is the teaching that you have this opportunity pretty much at every moment. It's almost like this, one of the ideas in the Buddhist teachings of sort of the bardos being every breath, every transition from one moment to the next. There is this bardo or this place of potential confusion or potential growth and insight and service. Um, and if you can knowingly uh, bring your attention to those moments between things that and turn towards the difficulties that you face rather than turning away from them and seeing them as an inconvenience or even if they're not difficult sort of botherations. Um, what if I see myself turning away from the difficulties? You come to me. Oh, okay. <laughs> <I'll say what? laughs> Yeah, yeah one, but one. you do, you know, that's exactly where you go with it, is you sort of have this, you know, sort of thing where the mind becomes the, both the only tool in some ways 
that can help you through some of these times, but also the one part of you that is really blocking your path um, mm -hmm. in certain ways. And, and then that comes back around to the practice of discernment or viveka kyatihi, discriminating awareness, that is central to the yogic teachings and the yoga sutras all about that. That, yeah. you know, that discriminating awareness is how we polish um, the merging of sort of interfacing with the world. And um, the, the um, more clear vision of what is actually happening the yaksha or the events that are rising up before our eyes. The discriminating awareness is a process that helps to wake up in those moments. And there, every moment is one of those moments, in a sense. Yeah. And, and discriminating awareness or the veka kyatihi is this process where, of perception, where something is happening, like you're sitting in, in front of your computer watching a screen, and these two people are blabbing, and this is this input, this uh, input that is coming into your senses. And so you have, we have just huge amounts of input from all of our different senses, the, you know, from smell and taste and touch and, you know, and hearing, etc., but they're all coming in at once, and we've got to filter them. But we also, um, often in that process, uh, filter them in a way that is uh, based on habitual patterning, some scars. And so, discernment and discriminating awareness is what can um, present maybe. You could even call it a, a pause or a threshold to um, be more attentive and s therefore see more clearly. So the process is, mm -hmm. you know, a sensation arises, and before you've even named it, there is some perception in, through one of the senses of this, you know, sensation arising, and then instantly the mind is on board and figures it out, and. Mm -hmm. Nine times out of ten, it's probably relatively accurate how the um, how the mind interprets it. But then you run into things like confusing a snake with a rope, etc. You know, and so the mind perceives something, and then the story of you. This is where it kind of goes off the rails. The story of you that is your ego function, which is a good function, but needs to have um, an attendant that is more <laughs> mature or something. The ego function jumps in and, and runs away with a story. And, and then your direct experience of what is before you is no longer as clear. And so that with discriminating awareness, you see that whole process, including your tendency of small self to jump in and co-opt the situation. And mm -hmm. at that point, somewhere between perceiving and making a decision about what it is you perceive um, and the ego taking over, you take action of some sort. But then it comes to a point where the next step is to pause and put it down and see what the very next moment is. That's the point in Viveka Kyatihi that is so often overlooked, is am I perceiving things correctly based on what my perceptions were and what the impact, the feedback I'm getting from my actions. And so you pause then, and then the whole process begins again, another sensation, another you know, perception and interpretation, etc. So when we are in these moments of transition, it is this art form uh, to become agile at waking up to the moment. 
waking up, seeing it, making a conclusion, taking action, and we'll talk about that in a second, but taking action and then letting it go and starting over. And so, and that yeah. is the process of discriminating awareness. So that it, the more you do that, the more quickly you can set it down and look again, the more accurate your perceptions start to be. Yeah, you start, you learn more quickly. Yeah. And then learning, then you can be more skillful because you're going to, and of course, you know, someone would say, well, it's not actually you taking the action. It's your body taking the action and it's not action. But, yeah. you know. We'll, we'll talk about that over dinner. Dinner. <laughs> yeah, again. Right now, <laughs> yeah, who's eating at this time? <laughs> um, but uh, the... Uh, I forgot what I was oh, saying. I thought, I thought about dinner. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but... Yeah. Uh, yeah, that, that the ego function uh, is so useful, um, such a, uh, and it's there, and it's basically the ego function is time and space. Mm -hmm. You know, it's going to be the manifestation of these things, and you can learn and keep upgrading. And there's no official limit as to how amazing yeah. and how useful uh, the ego function can be because then you start making plans uh, and even and you use the ego function to plan well how can I make other beings uh, have fun or be happy or mm -hmm. including you know local ones big ones little ones how can I do that and so the and who knows you might come up with something amazing yeah, yeah. and uh, that's quite exciting. Uh, so we keep, keep learning. And this is what, in my personal experience, what the practices like sitting practice, meditation practice, where the mind is, tra is really being trained to um, come back again and refocus. And the mind is, is being trained to uh, w wake up and then wander off and then it's not being trained to wander off it does that normally but it's being trained to um, notice that and to come back and so the more you do that the more quickly and the more easily and without um, effort and without making mm -hmm. it into a big deal like oh look I'm meditating um, or with asana the same thing how the body and the breath and the movement coordinate to take uh, form and um, how the feedback loops between, you know, the, the physical body, the deep levels of body, the deep levels of mind through the breath and the fascia, how all of those things interface, um, those processes that are going on all around us and within us all the time, if we notice, those become much more common in a sense, and not in a sense of, oh, they're not good because they're common. They're, they're just quite vivid and quite accessible and quite, um, you're able to maneuver the world without making them into a big deal. And, um, and that's really where transitions start to flow in a way um, where mm -hmm. you are interfacing with the gunas in a way that is uh, of service and valuable. Um, and so then it comes to the next step in this process of bringing awareness to transitions is that at some point in this, um, f discerning what you really... Uh, feel is a foundational intention of yours in life, what you really feel is important. In other words, what, what actions in this final stage of, of discriminating awareness, what actions you can take that are in alignment with your understanding and your belief in uh, truth 
the truths of being and being an embodied entity. What actions you can take that are in alignment with that so that you can um, interface mm -hmm. elegantly and with uh, a, um, a gesture of generosity and service and kindness in a picture that is far bigger than any one ego wants to see at mm -hmm. any given moment. But once you start really feeling how good it feels to interface in that way, where you said, well, I, you know, for instance, you know, really feel strongly that, you know, I hope that my actions, my intention is that my actions promote peace or... Right. Um, and, and often, yeah. Yeah, our action might make it worse. Yeah. Um, but you got to do the... Uh, absolute best you can based on that intention and then but it's all science you know you don't know until you try and then if you if there's a sincerity there you'll get you'll be sensitive to the feedback which yeah. will come and, uh, and the, the action then is is not the intention it's the action that's been inspired by the intention and if the intention uh -huh. is strong and real yeah, then, then you see beyond the action and you decide well that didn't work and the no. ego is no longer threatened by that mm -hmm. so yeah i was just thinking that all of these things uh all our plans and then our even our pauses uh when we have a good pause and a good Nirodha Samadhi, we're going, wow. Uh, that still leaves uh, in the body uh, a pattern. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and if, in that occasion, you'll get like this taste of like, oh, and you'll be the joy of complete release. But then, at a certain point, the mind will then put a, a subtle wrapping around it, an association with it, and you have to begin again. Mm -hmm. and, uh, apparently, according to some of these traditions, uh, there's no end to it. And this is a cause of great happiness, rather than, oh, there's no end to this. Um, and, uh, and so you go, yes. And so that is both, I'm thinking, in the, the um, Hayana Buddhist thing, there's no end. To it. And then the devotional attitude in, in India, like in the Bhagavad Gita, there's a great joy in the fact that there's, because yeah. there's so many beings. Who knows how many sentient beings there are? Okay. I keep losing count, you know, <laughs> trying to keep a record, and uh, there's a lot. Yeah. And how much time is in the future? Yeah. You know, you think about that. Or is there even a future? Yes, and the yes, relief yes. is, what future? Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's just now. And uh, so it's a, it's, even though it's deadly serious, it's kind of a playful yeah. sport. Yeah. And it's, it's yeah. really important as we practice, as we get older and look back at uh, different phases in yoga over the last 40 years and in our own practices, you know, it's really important to approach these practices with incredible sincerity and earnestness and um, put the effort in that is required. And at the very same time, to be soft and not um, dogmatic and not, you know, gets... And, and so, it, it, as Richard's saying, it's kind of this approach of things being fun and real rather than contrived. Because at every moment, in even the process of doing practices, there is this potential to sort of run off in some direction of ego, mm -hmm. mine, for five or six or a thousand lifetimes. Uh, and then 
wake up when you hit a certain threshold and say, wait a minute. Uh, so the practice becomes, you know, to find whatever ways you yourself, me, myself, Richard, yourself, you know, these cicadas outside our window themselves, like to find a way to be in this moment um, and be awake. And you can't do that all the time. So you have to see the humor in not being able to do it and bring the sincerity in attempting yeah. to do it. Um, so the great opportunities. <laughs> yeah. This could be one of them. This could be one of them. <laughs> Good. So shall we? Yeah. How are we doing with that? So, oh dear, we've run on. <laughs> um, so, we hope that we've confused you, and we hope that we've given you some areas that you can uh, check out to not be confused um, and to keep working more deeply. Um, and we hope that maybe some of the things we've said have actually helped. Um, and really, we encourage mm. you to take the time to pause when you do feel confusion and to set things down um, for just a moment. Um, and it really, truly takes one or two of Bushinda's, you know, prana apana joinings to do that. So it's not difficult. Yeah. Mm. And mm. read the Yoga Vasishta. It's uh, a <laughs> wonderful... It's, a, it's just an amazingly beautiful text that I've just read teeny bits of because it's so long. But any section that you read is just mind-blowing. At least interesting. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Shall we? Yeah. Thank you for joining us. And uh, we'll stay on the line a little bit after this uh, for questions. But please... Please keep practicing.